I'm Megan Gray, a neonatologist and assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington and Seattle Children's Hospital in Seattle, Washington. In the following modules, I will review continuous positive airway pressure, conventional mechanical ventilation, and high frequency ventilation. Module 1, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. After watching this module, you should know the indications and techniques for delivering continuous positive airway pressure to infants, the effects and risks of continuous positive airway pressure, and understanding the role of CPAP in planning ventilation therapy for infants with respiratory failure. Continuous positive airway pressure, commonly known as CPAP, is predominantly used as a non-invasive means to augment the inspiratory and expiratory phases in spontaneously breathing patients. CPAP should not be confused with positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP. While both CPAP and PEEP provide continuous distending pressure, PEEP is the positive pressure applied to mechanically ventilated infants during the expiratory phase. The applied continuous positive pressure is transmitted from the upper airway, or nasopharynx, where it is delivered down to the lungs and aids in maintaining or increasing lung expansion by a variety of mechanisms that will be described later. CPAP can be used as a primary ventilation strategy with the goal of providing a constant distending pressure or avoiding intubation and positive pressure inflations. CPAP can be continued until the infant's respiratory status either improves or treatment failure is determined. Treatment failure for CPAP is usually defined in studies as the need for intubation and mechanical ventilation or death. CPAP is available as a rescue strategy when modalities such as low and high frequency nasal cannula fail to correct respiratory insufficiency. CPAP is also used as a step-down modality for intubated, invasively ventilated infants who are ready to extubate, such as those with BPD. CPAP is a valid respiratory support modality for any spontaneously breathing infant. Data around the benefit to patients out Outcomes are limited and will be discussed later in the module, but despite this, CPAP is a commonly used modality in the delivery room for treatment of pulmonary hemorrhage and for RDS in pulmonary preterm infants. The benefit of CPAP for treatment of apnea of prematurity are unclear, but in a Cochrane review by Lemery et al. comparing CPAP alone or CPAP with non-invasively delivered breaths, otherwise known as NIPPV, NIPPV reduced the need for intubation within a week of extubation but had no effect on other important measures of respiratory morbidity. For term infants, CPAP is frequently used in the treatment of transient tachypnea of the newborn, pneumonia, and weakness of the upper airway structure and lower airway structures. CPAP is also a common step-down modality for infants being extubated after short or long-term invasive ventilation. CPAP and its related techniques are often used for long periods of time in infants with significant bronchopulmonary dysplasia as a bridge to move them from prolonged intubation to a level of support that's amenable for home care. Studies of CPAP for all of these uses have been limited despite its popularity as a support modality. CPAP can be delivered using a wide variety of devices with different modifications. No one method of CPAP is proven superior, but studies are ongoing. Bubble CPAP uses a system where gas flows through a tube submerged at variable depths to generate the pressure delivered to the patient. This method creates small oscillations in the pressure as the bubbles pass through the system, which is theorized to improve ventilation compared to constant pressure CPAP. Ventilators can be used to deliver CPAP and can be modified to provide breaths with a positive inspiratory pressure above the dialed-in CPAP, or PEEP. This modality is known as NIPPV, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, occurs when the breaths are unsynchronized with infant's respiratory effort. Synchronized NIPPV, or otherwise known as NAVA, is when there is a sensor or probe used to synchronize the delivered breaths to the infant's spontaneous breaths. BiPAP and CIPAP are modalities that use two levels of CPAP that are alternated at a rate that is chosen by the provider. BiPAP uses a straight change in pressure that looks like a square wave, whereas CIPAP creates a sinusoidal pressure wave with the high and low point weight of the waves set to the two different CPAP levels. Heated high-flow nasal cannula is a newer modality that delivers a humidified gas flow rate in liters per minute instead of a set pressure. Heated high-flow nasal cannula has some CPAP-like effects. Studies comparing high-flow nasal cannula and CPAP have mostly been small pilot studies without sufficient power to understand the comparison between the two. Experimental therapies with CPAP delivered via oscillating ventilators are ongoing. In this diagram of bubble CPAP, the depth of the exhalation tubing under the water determines the pressure delivered to the airway. The inhalation side of the device provides the gas flow, including a blender to provide variable oxygen levels if desired, and a humidifier. CPAP should always be delivered with humidified gas to prevent drying of the airway mucosa, which could lead to plugging. There are many different devices and interfaces to deliver CPAP and its related modalities. 
These can generally group, be grouped into masks, prongs, and cannulae, as shown in the picture. This diagram shows the pressure time graph of CPAP as compared to bilevel CPAP, such as BiPAP or CIPAP. Note that the pressure variations secondary to spontaneous breathing are augmented by the CPAP and can be further augmented by providing two levels of positive pressure, as in BiPAP or CIPAP. To understand how CPAP works at the alveolar level, we will review Laplace's law. Laplace's law states that the pressure in a sphere is equal to twice the surface tension divided by the radius. Thus, if you increase the radius of the sphere, the pressure needed to stay inflated decreases. CPAP works by increasing the inflation of alveoli, which increases the radius. Assuming that the surface tension stays the same, which is an assumption that is not necessarily true in real life due to the unique properties of surfactant, but we will keep it for this explanation, the pressure needed to maintain the alveolar inflation would be lower. CPAP has effects at many levels in the respiratory system. Pressure in the lungs as a whole increases transpulmonary pressure, which stabilizes the chest wall and reduces resistance to breathing. More inflation in the airways activates stretch receptors and reduce collapse of both the large and small airways, which reduces apnea. At the alveolar level, CPAP helps open and maintain recruitment of individual alveoli, which increases the functional residual capacity, leading to larger tidal volumes. More open alveoli reduces the area of collapsed lung disease, which in turn reduces VQ mismatch and improves compliance. All of these together improve gas exchange and reduce respiratory distress. The benefits to CPAP can be summarized as an increase in FRC, pulmonary compliance, spontaneous tidal volume, and airway diameter, as well as a decrease in the respiratory effort, the arterial alveolar oxygen gradient, and alveolar collapse. CPAP may help to conserve surfactant and splint open the airway as well as the diaphragm, reducing mechanical obstructions, such as those meconium or other mucus plugging diseases. Despite the popularity of CPAP, many studies into the benefits of CPAP have significant limitations in interpretation. What we do know is summarized in the 2015 Cochrane Review of Continuous Distending Pressure, a review that includes two studies using face mask CPAP, two using continuous negative pressure on the thorax, a modality no longer in use, one using nasal CPAP, and one using endotracheal CPAP as a straight peep. Two-thirds of the included randomized studies were from the late 1970s, meaning there was little or no surfactant or antenatal steroid use included in the patients in the study, a major limitation given the high usage of these therapies combined with CPAP in modern practice. As most of the studies included in this analysis compared CPAP to the standard of care at the time, which ranged from observation with or without supplemental oxygen all the way through immediate intubation, it's difficult to extrapolate to modern practice. From the studies we have, we know that CPAP produces the combined outcome of need for invasive mechanical ventilation and death in preterm infants, as well as the need for transfer to a higher level of care for infants with greater than 30 weeks gestation who have respiratory distress. The use of continuous distending pressure reduces mortality, both for all preterm infants as well as those greater than 1,500 grams. The number needed to treat is low in the 5 to 7 range for reduction in death or intubation. The effect of CPAP on BPD has not been favorable in randomized trials or long-term cohort trials. One more modern trial of note is the COIN trial by Morley et al., which randomized 25 to 28-week infants to non-invasive CPAP or immediate intubation and surfactant. They found no difference in BPD at 36 weeks corrected and no reduction in mortality. However, the investigators did find a reduction in needing oxygen at 28 days of life as well as fewer days of mechanical ventilation in the, the neonates randomized to the non-invasive CPAP. This is considered a landmark trial and is included in the supplemental materials section of this program. Following this trial, others with similar randomization were completed and a meta-analysis conducted by Schmolzer et al. showed that survival to 36 weeks without BPD was slightly improved by use of CPAP in the delivery room. The number needed to treat based on this meta-analysis was 25. Overall, CPAP is a very safe therapy when applied with care and careful monitoring. The most common complication quoted in the literature is pneumothorax or other air leak syndromes. Pneumothoraces are still relatively rare, but when compared to non-positive pressure ventilation strategies, the number needed to harm is 10 patients. Plugging of the nares is common with all CPAP devices, despite humidification of the delivered gas. Careful attention to signs of nasal obstruction, plugging, suctioning are usually sufficient to overcome this issue. 
In some cases, the pressure from the delivery device on the nares, septum, or surrounding skin can cause breakdown. In extreme cases, significant necrosis and tissue loss have been reported. Gastric distension is common with all non-invasive respiratory support modalities and is colloquially known as CPAP belly. This is rarely clinically significant, but can be distressing for caregivers and can lead to additional workup in cases where providers become concerned about abdominal pathology. In this module, we reviewed the wide range of modalities that can be used to deliver CPAP and related non-invasive respiratory support. We reviewed the physiologic effects of CPAP, including Laplace's law, as well as the indications and complications from CPAP. Additional supplemental materials are available for this program. This concludes Module 1. Thank you for your attention. We would like to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Organization of Neonatology Training Program Directors, Neo Reviews, and Abbott Nutrition for their support of this educational program. This concludes this module.